I'm your host, attorney Mary Kay Loyan. To be or not to be, and what's in the benefit? We'll be discussing that today with our guests. With us to, our, to my right is attorney William, uh, William Clark Jr. of Drinker Biddle and Reith in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And you do corporate and securities law. Yes, that's right, Mary Kay. Thank you for having me here with you today. Oh, you're welcome. And, and to his right, we have Ms. Laura Stanton of Dancing Deer Baking Corporation. She is the Director of Marketing for Dancing Deer. Welcome, Laura. Well, and thank you very much for uh, inviting Dancing Deer to the table. It's a pleasure. And to her right, we have Mr. Carter Powers, COO of Demoggy Inc., located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. So between Laura and Carter, we have our local uh, benefit corporations uh, represented here today. Well, let's start with our first question. Uh, Bill, can you describe what a benefit corporation is and how it differs from the traditional corporate structure? A benefit corporation is a new form of business corporation. It's still a corporation that's conducted for profit, but what's different about it is that it's also operated in a way that's intended to have a material positive impact on society and the environment. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, what it's really doing is trying to maximize what we call the triple bottom line. That's the three P's, which stands for people, planet, and profit. Mm -hmm. I see. And that is different from our traditional corporate structure, I understand, which was purely profit driven. Yes, that's correct. The accepted norm for corporation law in the United States is what we call shareholder wealth maximization. Mm -hmm. The notion is that the only purpose of a corporation and the job of the directors who run the corporation is to maximize its profitability mm -hmm. for the benefit of the shareholders only. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, how many states approximately have um, become benefit corporations? Uh, at this point, um, as a result of the passage of a statute in New Mexico just last week, there are now 14 jurisdictions in the United States that have authorized benefit corporations. And of course, one of the reasons we're doing the show today is that Massachusetts was the 11th state, uh, and the Massachusetts statute has taken effect. And we actually have a couple of Massachusetts businesses here today to tell us about the benefits of that statute and how great they think it is. So. Right, okay. and, and they were the first to sign up to become benefit corporations when that uh, took effect in December of 2012. All right, now what advantages, Bill, does this new entity have um, to bring startups um, up to uh, benefit status and as well as existing corporations? There are several benefits that we've seen already. One of the things that's very attractive to people is that in the benefit corporation form, there's ability to do what people call protect the mission of the corporation. If the corporation is being run by people who are very committed to the notion of the triple bottom line and mm -hmm. having a positive effect, they sometimes worry that if, uh, as the business evolves, they would need to sell out to a new owner or bring in additional investors, that that might compromise the commitment of the business mm -hmm. to its mission as originally founded. One of the purposes of the benefit corporation statute is to protect that mission. Another thing that we found is that it's actually helpful in attracting capital. Sometimes people ask us, well, who would want to invest in one of these kinds of corporations? Right. And what we found is that there are quite a few investors who are actually looking for this kind of socially responsible investment. Recent studies suggest that there's over $3 trillion of investment capital that's looking to be invested in these kinds of businesses. And one of the nice things about the benefit corporation form is that by identifying companies that are already committed to the triple bottom line, it helps in the search for appropriate investments for people who are looking for this kind of business. I see. Well, it sounds like something that uh Several are going to, will be on board once the word is out there about what they can do to make this a, a pro profitable as well as a sustainable uh, enterprise. Now, can you explain um, a little bit more about uh, the stakeholders versus the shareholders? You already explained a little bit about the triple bottom line, but I think the guests need to understand a little bit more about what exactly is a stakeholder versus a shareholder and how do they differ. One of the most significant 
changes that's made in the new corporate form is to redefine the duties of the directors of the corporation. And what the statute requires is that the directors consider the interests not only of the shareholders, but also all of the other constituents of the corporation. These are the interests that you just referred to as the stakeholders. So the statute actually says that when the directors make decisions, they have to consider the interests of the employees of the business and its suppliers and subsidiaries. The directors have to consider the interests of the communities in which the corporation has locations. The directors have to consider the impacts of the business on the environment. And so all of these things are what we think of as the stakeholders. Now, notice that I said that one of the stakeholders or the constituencies is the shareholders. Remember that this right. is a triple right. bottom line. So we're considering the interest of the shareholders, but we're also considering the interest of society and the environment. Whereas traditional corporations don't have this triple bottom line and don't consider all those elements. Yes, that's correct. There are some states that give the directors permission to consider these other constituencies. But what's very different about the benefit corporation form is that the directors actually have a duty to consider all of the constituencies. Mm -hmm. So there's really this commitment mm -hmm. to considering in every instance the full impact of the business. I like to think of it as people running their business in a way that is as responsible as possible to everyone that the business mm -hmm. touches. Mm -hmm. Economists sometimes refer to what they call the externalities of a corporation or a business's activities. Essentially what they're talking about is the fact that when every business is doing things, it's affecting a lot of right. people. It's employees, the communities, it's customers, the environment, and what we're simply saying here is that in the benefit corporation form, there's a commitment to being as responsible as possible to all of those constituencies while making a profit and being financially successful. Right. Now, the, from what I understand, there were constituency states that were considered constituency states. Am, am I correct on that? Yes. There are 30-some states that already say directors may consider the interest of constituencies, but it's only in the 14 states that have passed benefit corporation mm -hmm. statutes where it's a required consideration. I so see. we've moved from permissive to required, essentially from the ability to do something to a commitment to making sure that that happens. So from permissive to mandatory. Exactly. That's the heart of the concept. <laughs> well, it sounds like that'll put everyone on the same path if once the, uh, all the states have ado adopted this new legislation. Well, we're certainly <laughs> hoping that we'll pick up all the rest of the states. Uh, we've been surprised at the success we've had in passing 14 statutes already. Mm -hmm. And we'll have some of our success stories uh, in a moment. So uh, that will help move things along, I'm sure. Now, the Benefit Corporation provides the directors and offices who are corporate fiduciaries with monetary protection mm -hmm. if they choose to provide monetary or other benefits to this, these stakeholders other than the shareholders. Uh, can you explain a little bit about um, you know, what other beneficiaries and, who, uh, in, and how they can be benefited just a little bit? What are some of the benefits? Um, the benefits that may accrue to the various constituencies will depend on the particular issue that the business is wrestling with. Mm -hmm. So it may be considering opening a new facility or it may be considering changing its benefit package for its employees. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, those decisions will obviously immediately impact the employees. Right. Uh, where you're thinking about locating a new facility, that will also impact communities. Uh, as you're designing a new facility, that will obviously have environmental considerations. Mm -hmm. So the particular impacts will vary depending on what the issue is that the directors are considering. That's one of the reasons that the statute doesn't try to tell directors how to discharge these new responsibilities. It simply says that the directors must consider all these interests and it's up to the directors in any particular instance to figure out how to balance and weigh the interests because obviously uh, various decisions and questions that will face the board will impact one or more of the constituencies differently. Mm -hmm. And I think as we talk to our friends from Damagi and from Dancing Deer, they will be able to tell us how they've been 
balancing these considerations and how they've been trying to be responsible as they run their business. Sure, okay. and, and that leads me to Carter. C Carter, um, Domagi was once a foreign corporation and it became a benefit corporation. Um, what motivated your organization to adopt this new corporate structure? Great. Well, thanks again for having me, and I'll give uh, just maybe a 10-second intro into what Demagi does sure. and then jump Please. into that. So Demagi is a mobile health software company. We focus specifically on open source technology development. Most of our work is done in Africa and India. We have about 55 team members globally um, and about 30 team members based in Boston. We've been a, a company since 2002, and really, we speak to what Bill was talking about, about protecting the mission. Uh, so Demagi's always been a very mission-driven social enterprise. So we kind of pride ourselves on our mission being impact, team satisfaction, and profit. And then we always put in parentheses after that, in that order. And I think that fits very well with the Benefit Corp mission. And uh, I would add a little bit to what Bill said, that I think what Demagi was trying to do in becoming a Benefit Corporation is both to protect the mission uh, for kind of future events, to commit ourselves to the mission with our current employees, and then really to compete on these other principles that we think are important parts of running a business, which are the kind of impact, team satisfaction driven mm -hmm. components. Mm -hmm. So I think for Demagi, it's really been a natural evolution of something we've really prided ourselves from the beginning, and this is really an opportunity for us to commit to that mission and kind of then start talking about the next phase, which is trying to encourage other corporations to really compete on these values. Right. And it's been working for your company, obviously. So we, we've been quite successful, and I, I think this speaks to really why members become a benefit corporation. Mm -hmm. So I think we have really been trying to recruit the best people from day one. And we haven't quite always been the company that prides themselves only on financial returns. So we're really looking for individuals who also aren't trying to maximize their own profit or their own returns. And a lot of what we bring to the table is these other benefits around team satisfaction and really making societal impact mm -hmm. with our software. And we think that is really something that should be in the equation, mm -hmm. both for new recruits as well as people deciding where to take their business. And did, did not your corporation have its roots at MIT as well? We did. So we are uh, an offshoot out of Harvard and MIT. So we uh, have been Cambridge and uh, Boston bred, uh, as they say. So. We were originally incorporated in Delaware in 2002, which is really common for many mm -hmm. uh, corporations and entrepreneurs. And this was uh, an opportunity for us with Massachusetts really passing the benefit mm -hmm. legislation for us to reconsider how important this mission is to us. And we saw it as an opportunity to do a little bit more paperwork, but really commit uh, both to Demagi but also to Massachusetts as something that we really think is an important value that our entrepreneurs and our new companies should have on the table. And I'm sure you have a lot of employee satisfaction because of this. I think our employees would say their satisfaction comes right after impact and right before making sure that we're providing them kind of the basic things they need. But I think what's great about this is really our founders and our shareholders are all really unified behind this mission. And I think for us, it was a no-brainer decision. Well, that's great. Now, is your corporation B certified? So we were B certified since 2008. Uh, so this is a, a common distinction between what it means to be B certified versus become a benefit corporation. Right. And B certified means that we've been working with B Lab and filling out the assessment, uh, which really certifies you independent of the legal and kind of shareholder amendment, which Bill was referencing. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a really uh, important distinction, but at the same time, it really, I think both show your commitment to these missions, and one is really the state and the legal uh, approval to really follow up on those missions. Right. Now we're going to go back to Bill and we're going to talk a little bit about what Carter was just talking about, B certification. Who are these third party certifiers and what, what is the verification uh, process? Yes, there are quite a few certifying organizations and there are quite a few people that are working on the question mm -hmm. of how do you measure and report these broader impacts of a business. Mm -hmm. It's very easy today to know how to prepare the financial statements for right. a company. We have generally accepted accounting principles and generally accepted auditing standards, mm -hmm. and everyone understands those and they're used for financial statements. What we don't yet have is an agreed system for reporting on these broader social and environmental impacts of a mm -hmm. business. There's actually an organization called the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, which mm -hmm. is working on coming up with standards that can be used to report. 
Prince Charles over in England has an initiative that he calls A4S, which stands for Accounting for Sustainability, which is again an attempt to create an integrated reporting system that would take both the financials of a company and also measurements of its environmental and social impact and put them into one measure. Separate and apart from those efforts, uh, we just heard a reference to B certification that mm -hmm. Damagi has gone through. And I believe Dancing Deer is a certified B corporation Not as well. Not yet. We're actually yet. working towards in that. Process. You're in the process. Yes. In okay. Process. Yes. That's a program that's run by a particular nonprofit called B Lab. And what is involved is taking a test, which is called the B Impact Rating System. And what you do is get online, about 7,000 businesses have taken this rating uh, test mm -hmm. already. And you answer a whole variety of questions, there are 200 questions. And if you score highly enough, then B Lab will license to you the right to call yourself a certified B Corporation. Mm -hmm. Then you can make available every year to people your um, certification report so they can tell how you've been doing. One of the things that the Benefit Corporation statute requires um, is the preparation of an annual report every year by each Benefit yes. Corporation. And let me talk a little bit about Please. that because it relates to this question as well. Please. The statute says that the corporation is to prepare this report which describes how it's done in its pursuit of environmental and social benefits during the past year. Essentially, I think you can think of it as a supplement to the financial statements that the business prepares. Right. Effectively, if you put together the financial statements and the benefit report, you should have information that will help you understand the full triple bottom line for the business. And what the statute says is that the report is to be prepared using a third party standard. At this point in time, there is not one recognized standard, as I was just mm -hmm. describing. There right. are a lot of people working on this. So rather than trying to pick, the statute says that the business can decide which standard that it wants to use. Mm -hmm. Obviously, B Lab and the uh, B Impact Rating System is one of those standards. The United Nations has prepared something called the Global Reporting Initiative. Right. Underwriters Laboratory has mm -hmm. uh, a standard that can be used to measure sustainability. The International Standards Organization has something called ISO 26000, which is another one of these standards. So there are at least 10 or 12 standards that are available for companies to choose from at this point. Obviously, the hope is that at some point, uh, we will have moved far enough along in the development of these concepts that we'll have a generally accepted set of principles mm -hmm. for reporting on sustainability. But we don't have that yet. So we're kind of all working together trying to figure out the best way to move this movement forward and to uh, come up with ways of comparing businesses and measuring impact. I see. Now, of these verification processes, to your knowledge, knowledge are they, do they appear to be similar, at least initially? Uh, they are all looking at very much the same set of issues. Uh, and I should note as well uh, that there's another question that's kind of lurking in this that, that we need to address, and that is the question of certification itself. Right. Uh, what Damagi is is a certified B Corporation because B Lab, after they took the test and did well enough, <laughs> actually cross-examined them and made sure that the answers to their questions were reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and every year, B Lab audits on a random basis a number of the companies that it certifies. That auditing requirement is not in statute. That's simply a voluntary program that the B Lab uh, is engaged in because they want to make sure that their certification is meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think eventually we will see a movement toward having a company's compliance with these various standards mm -hmm. audited or certified. If you talk to people at some of the big four accounting firms, they will tell you that they already have practice groups mm -hmm. that are developing standards for auditing and certifying their clients' compliance with whatever standard they may choose. But again, we're very much at the infancy of this yes. movement, right? And we yes. know where we think it's going to move, but obviously the world is unpredictable and lots of 
interesting developments are still to come. I'm sure. Yeah. But is this what they call the method to avoid the greenwashing is what we've, we've heard in the press, this greenwashing where if there's not a third party certifier that there's no way of actually measuring whether these initiatives have actually been successful? Yes, let's, let's talk about greenwashing very yes. briefly. Uh, obviously the term comes from the similar term whitewashing, you know, trying <laughs> yes. to portray yourself as better than you are. In greenwashing, the notion is that a company believes that there will be public relations benefits to portraying itself as environmentally and socially responsible, and yet the substance may not be there. So there's a concern that companies will uh, try to take advantage of the consuming mm -hmm. public and, and particularly try to take advantage of conscious consumers who are looking for more responsible mm -hmm. companies. The benefit corporation statute attempts to address that problem in two ways. One is the requirement that uh, a third party standard be used to prepare the report. The other part of the approach to greenwashing in the benefit corporation statute, which I think is very important, is a requirement that the annual report be publicly available. Right. So if you're a benefit corporation, one of the things you're committing to do is to give any member of the public a copy of your most recent annual report that describes how you've done. And that's the transparency that is part of this. That's the transparency that's very important, we think, and really addressed to this whole question of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. yes. And that, in that independent report, too, has to be done by an independent source, I, I understand. Well, the report is prepared by the company and it has to use one of these third-party standards. Mm -hmm. The statute does not require that the third-party standard provider actually audit the company's report. Mm -hmm. I think that some companies eventually may adopt a practice yes. of having their auditors, when they certify their financial statements, also take a look at their annual benefit report. Yes. Obviously, companies that are willing to do that are making an even greater commitment to transparency and to following through mm -hmm. on their commitments. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's go back to, uh, let's go to Laura now. Uh, Laura's from Dancing Deer, and uh, you make the great sweet treats that we all know. Uh, now Dancing Deer was also one of the first corporations to become a benefit corp, and to my understanding is working towards B certification that Bill alluded to. Uh, what led you to become a benefit corporation, and what, if anything, do you need to do to become B certified? Well, we were uh, very excited when this opportunity was made available to Dancing Deer uh, because since its founding in 1994 in Boston, the company has been very um, mission focused. Um, we, are, we make an all natural product. We're very committed to being um, environmentally conscious, to treating our employees fairly. Uh, to giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. So this uh, was an opportunity for us to sort of recommit more publicly and to be um, held accountable for practices that, you know, we have been um, living by for years. Um, you know, we, uh, we take our relationship with the community, our relationship with our employees, and then, of course, with our customers um, very seriously. And for about the past 18 months, we have been working towards becoming uh, B Corp as well, um, sort of taking the high standards that we've been trying to live by now mm -hmm. for 17 years sort of to the next level. Okay. And from what I understand, your corporation does a lot of volunteer work with the helps the homeless and does a lot of great things. And I and from what I understand, this B Corporation, I, excuse me, the Benefit Corporation really legitimizes what you've been doing all along. Right. As well as what Carter's Corporation has been doing all along. That's correct. We've had a relationship for over 10 years with an organization called One Family Inc., mm -hmm. um, which believes that the best way to help people and families from becoming homeless is to um, help get them uh, the proper amount of education. So One Family provides um, scholarships and stipends and um, sort of a helping hand to folks who might otherwise be living on the street, and particularly families, which is the largest growth area of the homeless right now. Right. Um, so we developed a line of products that we call Sweet Home mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's a variety of gifts that are available online mm -hmm. and 35 percent of the retail uh, price of those gifts is donated directly back wow. to one family. 
Um, so over the course of our relationship, we've contributed a, about a quarter of a million dollars to, uh, to one family. Mm -hmm. um, our employees also participate every year in a um, gingerbread house decorating tour. Uh, in the months of November and December, we go to eight to ten shelters. All of our employees participate. Mm -hmm. um, and we throw a gingerbread house decorating party for um, homeless families, moms and kids that wouldn't otherwise be able to sort of share this holiday, traditional holiday experience. So we bring our own gingerbread houses and candy and we throw a party and mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great time. Mm -hmm. It's really a wonderful. Well, um, what's really great about what you're doing is because of these budget cuts that we're now experiencing throughout our nation, that that middle class has shrunk, and a lot of them have become, in fact, homeless. Right. But as a smart initiative by your corporation, those people will not remain homeless once the economy recovers, and they will remember your corporation. And actually, this is a great way of of getting the name out for having done a great service to society and they will remember that and I think um, the company will flourish because of it. Well we hope so. I but, think uh, so. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do for your employees in particular? Well um, there's a number of things. Uh, we were you were talking about sort of how businesses make decisions right. and, and you know how um, taking employees and the environment into consideration. So for example when our business was rapidly expanding um, in 2007 and 8, we it became obvious that we needed to move into a new facility. So we were located on Shirley Street in downtown Boston, um, but we wanted you know to be able to retain our employees and continue to be committed to the city. So we we found a location in Hyde Park that is uh, less than a quarter of a mile from a train station, and we were able to. Um, you know, move to a bigger um, facility that would accommodate our growing business, but at the same time make it easy for our existing employees to stay with us um, because we were on public transportation. Um, you know, and we could we could continue to draw upon the inner city for our employees. Um, all of our employees are stakeholders mm -hmm. in the business. That so, was going to be my next yes, question. Yes, so both every, of you. everyone has a, a piece of the business, and so as, as we're successful, um, they, uh, we, I'm an employee, mm -hmm. will be as well. Um, we do our best to um, have flexible work hours, so for families that Excellent. need, that need um, you know, daycare consideration or um, health consideration or whatever, we're as flexible as we can be with working hours. Mm -hmm. um, so our employees are very, very important um, to the business. They are you know? the business. They are the business, they are exactly. The business. And what's interesting about that business model that you were just discussing about the employees, um, actually having an ownership interest, being right. stakeholders, what I think is really important about that in today's climate, we've actually heard on the news, on, on the traditional news channels, that they want to move back to more traditional ways of doing things, having people go to the office. And uh, that is going away from what the Benefit Corporation is trying to do, is trying to enable their employees to basically participate and be a, a productive member and in, in have a great impact on society as well. Yes, well we um, we couldn't live without our, uh, our bakers um, and, and just the great team of people that have been supporting Dance Year. We have a lot of very long-term um, employees, so we have a loyal base and it's terrific. Mm -hmm. And that adds stability to your corporation exactly. as well. Exactly. What, what I think is particularly yes. interesting about it is that by giving every one of their employees an ownership in the business, they're actually making capitalists out of all of their employees. Absolutely. <laughs> in, in some respects, the Benefit Corporation sounds like a very liberal, progressive kind of an idea. On the surface. On the surface, On but the surface. at bottom, it's also fundamentally committed to the system that's brought us the unparalleled prosperity we have in this country. It's simply yes. trying to expand that um, and make it even better and more responsive. And I think the notion that every one of their employees is a capitalist and owner of the <laughs> business is just a remarkable thing uh, and really captures the essence of what we're trying to do, which is to take the system and make it better, not destroy it, not change it. Uh, sustain but, the system. But sustain the system and really and move it. forward for the country. That's yes. right. 
Well, that's a very uh, interesting view. Carter, do you have something? Yeah, I'll, like I'll just add? chime in there as well, and I, I think I echo the the comments of my fellow panelists. But I, I think it's a really important point because when people ask about a benefit corporation, they imagine the spectrum in their mind of kind of a nonprofit and a for-profit. That's right. And kind of along that spectrum, this is kind of a niche in between. Um, those and I think from Demagi's history, we really have worked in global health for a long time, and global health is really dominated by nonprofits and NGOs. So a very common question we get is, why are you not a nonprofit? And I think it speaks to what Bill was saying that we really believe in a lot of these principles and are trying to do it in a sustainable way. So typically, when we talk to our partners, we talk about the reason why we are not a nonprofit. And uh, I like to say, before a benefit corp, I used to say we're a not for so much profit company. <laughs> um, but I, I'm thankful to replace that term because I don't think it's quite uh, as good. But uh, I, I think it's an important point that we still want to compete, and we want to compete on a different playing field, which includes these type of values, both when we think about our employees, but as well as our, our kind of market and who we're trying to reach. Yeah, and that's one thing I think I want to touch on a little bit, the difference between the, the notion of what is a non-profit and what is the benefit uh, corporation. Um, do, do you want to say a few words about of the, that differentiation? Sure. Uh, this is actually an important point for the audience to understand. There are a lot of businesses these days that I think of as hybrid entities. Yes. Uh, those would be businesses that in addition to having some for-profit economic activity that they're engaged in, also have a particular social mission or project that they want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That's not really the benefit corporation concept. The benefit corporation concept is rather that any business doing any kind of for-profit activity can do that business and that activity in a way that looks to the triple bottom line, that attempts to be responsible, as I said before, to society and the environment. The benefit corporation statutes recognize that a lot of benefit corporations may want to adopt the hybrid model. Mm -hmm. And so the benefit corporation statute actually provides the ability for a benefit corporation to say, we're going to have a particular specific public benefit that we want to accomplish. But that's not required. That's optional. Mm -hmm. But every benefit corporation is required to make this broader commitment to be responsible. So actually what, what we're seeing is businesses very much along the spectrum that was just described, where there are some that are hybrid more so than others, some that are more just traditional businesses seeking to be responsible in what they do. And all along that continuum, I think it's very exciting to see people experimenting and mm -hmm. trying to accomplish all kinds of great things in different ways. And hopefully, 10 years from now, we will have learned a lot and we'll be able to share lessons mm -hmm. so that Various people along that spectrum, you know, will be able to help others uh, in the way they want to run their businesses mm -hmm. as well. Now, I have a question along those lines too. Uh, in California, there's something called the um, FRP, I believe, the uh, Flexible Purpose. Uh, FPC. FPC, excuse right. me, FPC. Uh, could you just give us a little bit of a rundown of how the benefit corporation differs from this particular Flexible Purpose Corp? Yes, and actually, that relates to what we were just saying. Right. The Flexible Purpose Corporation in California is a model that permits a corporation to adopt a particular social purpose mm -hmm. or project. So it's the more specific, targeted approach to a particular objective that the corporation wants to achieve, as opposed to the notion of being responsible in whatever the corporation does. Mm -hmm. So the FPC is more for the classic hybrid business that simply wants to do one thing so that they're not necessarily committed to the overall triple bottom line, but they're committed to running their business into doing a particular project. So that's actually another way that society and the law is moving to experiment and to try and figure out what will have the best impacts. And really what we're doing is making options mm -hmm. available for business people mm -hmm. to choose from. From what my understanding is of the Flexible Purpose Corporation, that the benefit corporation actually goes above and beyond that and allows uh, more flexibility in the corporate structure? Yes, because in the benefit corporation, you don't necessarily choose a particular mission to fulfill. One of the questions that people have raised is when they think about a Flexible Purpose Corporation, they wonder what happens after the mission has been accomplished. Right. 
Yeah. As opposed to the benefit corporation notion, which is whatever the business is doing, it's going to try and be responsible. And it's a continuing it mission. And it's a continuing mission simply to have this positive impact in whatever it is doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, I, I just want to change um, the tone a little bit and just talk a little bit about um, the directors. Who is this benefit director? Uh, what is their what is their role? Um, do they write reports? Um, just a little bit about it. I'll start with Bill, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Yes, what what you're referring to is the requirement in the Massachusetts statute that a benefit corporation have one of its directors be designated mm -hmm. a benefit director. The principal job of the benefit director is to prepare a statement every year that goes into the annual report that the company issues which gives the benefit director's opinion as to how the business did in its pursuit of creating the positive impact on society and the mm -hmm. environment. I think a way to understand the benefit director concept is simply to think of the benefit director as an ombudsman. It's the person who knows that their job when they're in the boardroom is to think consciously about the social and environmental responsibilities of the business. Which is not to say, of course, that the other directors won't be thinking that as well, but it always helps to have someone know that they have a responsibility to do that. It is their role. And this is such a new concept that I'm not sure even that our guests today have had much experience with this because they've only been benefit corporations for less than a year. Uh, well, but it's something that they're, I'm sure, thinking about as they move forward. Do either of you have anything to say on that? Sure, I'll, I'll chime in uh, for Demagi's perspective. So it, it was a big, it's a real change. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Mass, as opposed to other states, this is one of those uh, items around a benefit corporation where not every state has required the benefit uh, director. And for us, uh, it was a, a quick race to get into the first cohort as a benefit corp. So we have an interim uh, benefit director right now with a plan for hiring, uh, or not hiring, pu uh, putting an independent member who's a, a doctor uh, as our benefit director. But I think the biggest thing I would say is that it's about independence. So mm -hmm. this yes, board director, um, and the reason why I couldn't put the person I want to on right now is because they had worked for us within the, the statute right. of and the you time. Be, yes, exactly. So employee. it can't be a, a shareholder above a certain value, and it can't have been a former employee with a certain time frame. Right. So I think the main message is that it's an independent director who's really uh, pro, er, anointed as the person who's signing off on this right. report. I think from our perspective, it wasn't a, a kind of game-changing uh, modification to our board. It's currently the two co-founders who are also core management team members. And at the end of the day, we pride ourselves on making technology that ultimately tries to save babies and things like that. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we're really heavily focused on our impact as our main product, as what we offer as a company. So for us, it really wasn't much of a transition because we think a lot of our initiatives line up very well with what we're committing to as a benefit corp. But it, it's a transition logistically, if nothing else, for us mm -hmm. to kind of figure out and sort through because this board member has real board privileges for all the other activities uh, of our board. So it's an important thing to note and see how they kind of play in an ongoing relationship. Mm -hmm. But it's still early. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll, we're still learning as we go. And that board member is responsible for writing these reports as well. Right, and, and it's their signature ultimately that it is the person uh, right. signing off. Yeah. And, and they have to be independent, as we said in Massachusetts. I don't know about other states. Uh, do they also have to be uh, independent? Those states that uh, require a benefit director require that the director be independent. Okay. But as was just noted, not every state requires the position. Right, okay. right. Okay. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about liability at all and uh, how this is the same, different than a traditional corporation, LLC, or, and uh, a little bit about that? Yes, let me just note that there is a provision in each of the benefit corporation statutes which says expressly that the directors of the corporation will not be personally liable, so they won't have to pay money damages <clears throat> as a result of discharging their duties under the benefit corporation statute. That was considered to be an important part of the statute because remember that this form is being created against the backdrop of traditional corporate law. Right. And under traditional laws, we said at the very beginning of the program, the norm is to maximize the value of the corporation for the shareholders. So there's a concern, obviously, that if a shareholder were to bring a lawsuit saying you have not maximized the value of the corporation, that's obviously inconsistent with being a benefit corporation, right. and the law should be clear that the directors are not liable to the shareholder on that basis. 
So we've tried to make that very clear in the statute. Yeah. Because under the traditional mm -hmm. statute, if, if the corporation did not make money for its shareholders uh, and they went and did something that could be socially responsible and that did detract <clears> from <throat> some of the uh, finances that could have gone to those shareholders, they could be subject to suit. Yes. We don't see those lawsuits very much, but what we do see are lawsuits at the time of a change of control mm -hmm. where directors have been sued for not taking the highest offer in a right. takeover attempt. And there's a doctrine in Delaware called the Revlon Doctrine, yes. which says that the job of the directors when there is a change of control on the table is to maximize the value purely for the shareholders. The benefit corporation statute says that that's no longer the rule because the benefit corporation statute wants to focus on preserving the mission of the mm -hmm. business and the impact that the change of control might have on the employees and the other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So that will be a very real difference as time moves forward and we have more experience with the mm -hmm. statute. Did you want to mention the case of Dodge v. v. Ford, which is an older case, and how that uh, changed? Sure. The, the case of Dodge v. Ford is about 100 years old. Uh, it was a fight involving Henry Ford and the Dodge brothers. Uh, the Dodge brothers, of course, were the people that formed the Dodge Motor Car Company. Right. And they were upset with Henry Ford because they were investors in Ford Motor Company, and they wanted Henry Ford to pay them a special dividend. And Henry Ford said, no, I want to take the money to reduce the price of my cars and pay my employees higher wages because that will make everyone more profitable and people will buy more Ford cars and be able to actually you know, purchase more of my automobiles. The Dodge brothers were unhappy. They brought a lawsuit. We know with hindsight that what the Dodge brothers wanted was actually money to set up a competing car company, but that was actually not talked about in the case. But what happened is that the Michigan Supreme Court ordered Ford Motor Company to pay a special dividend, and the opinion of the court in that case has become the classic expression of this notion of shareholder wealth maximization. The Michigan Supreme Court was very clear that the job of the directors was to maximize the value of the enterprise for the benefit of the shareholders, and they, they said that in so many words. As you look at American law, there were not a lot of cases following Dodge versus no, Ford weren't. where this came up. I think because the proposition was so well accepted that nobody tried to even challenge it. But what's interesting is that in 2010, yes. just a few years ago, there was a lawsuit in Delaware involving uh, Craigslist and eBay. Right. eBay had invested in Craigslist. The founders of Craigslist were afraid that eBay was going to try and change the culture of Craigslist. So the founders of Craigslist made some changes in its governance. eBay didn't like those because they're obviously designed to limit what eBay could do with its investment in Craigslist. They brought a lawsuit in Delaware, and the chancellor in Delaware reiterated the notion of shareholder wealth maximization. So um, e although there were not a lot of cases citing Dodge versus Ford for 100 years, uh, when the issue came up, it was very clear that American law is still based on the notion of shareholder wealth maximization. So, but the Revlon case uh, was much later than that? Uh, the Revlon case was in the 1980s. Oh, that 1980s. was, again, Delaware. Uh, that was established back in the days of the junk bond hostile takeovers. People may remember Michael Milken oh, and yes. everything that happened, and even the, the movies that Hollywood made uh, about hostile takeovers. That was in the 1980s. That has been uh, well litigated. You see Revlon cited quite a bit. Everyone understands that in the context of a change of control, if you're not a benefit corporation, the job of the directors is to get the highest price for the shareholders. So that is why it is, it is imperative that companies really take a look at this benefit corporation stature, the structure, to protect themselves from any potential liability because these cases are still good law. Yes. Uh, we think actually there are benefits to mission-driven companies that are very substantial and people really should uh, seriously consider this new form. Right. Either one of you have anything, any last words you'd like to say about it? Yeah, I'll chime in on liability. So I, I have heard some of those cases. Uh, I, th I think separate from the kind of court liability, I think you have a liability to your employees. Exactly. Um, and I think that would hit us before any of the legal action may. 
So I think uh, something I mentioned earlier about our commitment with a benefit corporation is I don't, we don't necessarily pay the highest market value salary-wise of what our software developers or other employees could get. So when we're looking at a software developer out of a school uh, and they're getting offers from Google and the Apple, we don't really pay those type of salaries. So what we do offer is the focus on impact, team satisfaction, and profit. So from our perspective, the liability of not living up to our benefit corporation is going to hit us in terms of our employees and keeping them satisfied because we almost have to commit to making sure we provide them with enough impact and enough team satisfaction or else ultimately they can get a better profit in the market. So I think this is where we uh, kind of reinforce the mission and I think other companies will follow suit on really trying to compete and offer these benefits that aren't necessarily the same as you would get on any for-profit corporation. Right, right. Laura, did you have anything you might want to add on any of these topics at all? Uh, one of the things that we haven't talked much about lately is, or in this conversation so far, is uh, protection of the environment, which is something right. that Dancing Deer has really been dedicated to for years, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that our packaging is as um, environmentally friendly and sustainable as possible. Um, we've, we recycle everything that we uh, legally um, can today and you know, are perhaps exploring the possibility of composting our food waste where necessary. So there's so many different things that the Benefit Corp will uh, not only allow us to do but just sort of encourage us to keep trying harder. Um, you know, to live up to what our founders really uh, set out for us in the first place. So it sounds like help your employees, mm -hmm. help your environment, and right. also help your bottom line at the exactly. same time. Not a bad, uh, not a bad idea. Right. Well, uh, I, I want to thank all of you for coming today. I think uh, we've covered quite a bit of, of ground. Uh, any last words from any one of you, or is that pretty much it? Yeah, We're good. We want to thank you again, uh, and thank you, Bill, for mm -hmm. flying here from Pennsylvania. We appreciate that. And Laura, we want to thank you for coming in from Boston, um, and Carter from uh, Cambridge. Cambridge. And um, I'm sure we'll have some follow-up to this uh, based upon um, what we will hear from our viewers. Again, thank you for tuning in today. I'm your host, Attorney Mary Kay Loyan. This was the Benefit Corporation Statute Information uh, Program, and we hope that you will tune in next time. And please remember, this information is for general informational purposes only. It is not legal advice. Please consult a legal or uh, professional of your choosing. And also, if you have any questions or comments for us, please go to our website at www.thelegaledition.com and tune in next time for another edition. Take care.